morning, Rose, and thanks very much for talking to me. It's really an exciting time for technology in schools with the publication of the Decoding Learning Report. Um, and I know that it's been very, very well, well received by many people, so I just wanted to have a quick chat with you about it and ask you some questions. Is that okay? Yes, that is absolutely okay. It's my pleasure, and I agree. It's a very exciting time. Um, you've had a very wide-ranging report, and you've looked at very ma many areas of learning in it. And I just wondered what sort of number of schools were engaged in the research and what sort of variety of schools were there. It's a very big range and variety, but to give you some specific information, um, the report here is based on written evidence. There's a list um, on page 65 of the report that goes through the kinds of information sources that we used. So all I can say is that there's more than 1,300 examples that we looked at as part of the report, and those examples may have been drawn from one or more learning settings, not all of which will have been schools. So it's impossible to actually say exactly how many schools were part of that data set or were represented in that data set because some of the reports will have been about learning at home and some of the reports will have involved more than one school and in the research papers they don't always identify exactly how many schools were involved so the reason I'm not able to give you a precise number other than to say that it's a lot and it's more than 1300 core examples is because the information isn't actually recorded in, in some of those information sources. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> it does make sense, Rose. It, it seems like there's a very widespread uh, array of good practice going yes. on already. So how you obviously sort of did the research over a period of time. Did you get any sort of sense of how that good practice was becoming even further widespread or any differences in the wisdom being applied to the uptake of tech in schools during the course of the study? I think the important thing is that we did this piece of research over six months, which is a very long period of time, but we looked at evidence that went back much further than that. So one of the most important things about the evidence that we looked at was that rather than doing what other meta-analyses have done in the past, we looked at both academic publications, corporate reports, meta-reviews, and very importantly, informal reports from practitioners about what they were doing in their classroom, because they are the things that aren't always included in these reviews. And I think it's really important that they are, because that's where you get a sense what I think it is you're getting at in your question of what's actually changing out there <laughs> in the yes. world of teaching and learning. And you get a much greater sense of speed of change than you do through more formal publication media that have often taken quite a long time to actually get to press. Do, do you know what I mean? And, and yeah. so my sense of what's happening is that teachers in schools, parents in homes, and educators in informal settings are starting to take things into their own hands more and more. And they're starting to look at how they can use sometimes freely available resources, sometimes resources that have been made available to them by the institutions that they work for, and try and turn them to meet their own needs. And I do sense that is a very powerful change that is starting to happen yeah. out there. And that's something we need to encourage. Yes, it is quite fledgling at the moment, and, uh, but it's there. And that's what we need to try and support more and more so that we stop asking the question, how can technology change teaching and learning? And start asking the question, how can teachers and learners start changing the technology so that it meets their needs? So that there, I do sense a change, a shift in power, and that's very important. Thank you. Um, so if you've got schools that are at this fledgling stage, they're starting to embark on that process of, of purchasing equipment, or maybe they've already purchased equipment and they want to make the best use of that, what sort of points do you think they need to take on board or to consider when they're, they're implementing new tech in their schools? I think you've got to look at the resources that you've got available. 
and you've got to look at what it is you need to do in your school. All schools are different, as you well know. It's it's not the state and the obvious, but it's something that we often forget. And their needs are different. One of the problems, I think, in the way that the evidence has been presented in the past is that we don't take enough notice of those differences. So often people will say, give me an example where technology is supporting learning. And you say, here's an example, but bear in mind what that context is like. So what's that particular school like? Because one school is very different to another. So schools need to say, what's our real learning need? What do our teachers and learners in this school need the most? Okay, we'll identify it. Maybe we think they need to be um, doing more work to explore their own understanding, for example. Maybe we want to put an emphasis on assessment in this school, but not assessment just in the formal sense of, of how you get your qualifications, but assessment in the formative sense, you know, assessment for learning, how, how we're more effective at being uh, assessing what our students understand so that we can support them more, more effectively. So perhaps you would say, okay, that's our key need. Now, what technology do we already have available to us? And What resources do we have in our teaching workforce? Who understands the technology the best? And maybe some of those people will actually be learners as well. Maybe some of our learners and our students are really important in in this resource space because they understand the technology best. And then start to put those things together and say, okay, how do we get people working together to use the technology that we've got more effectively to meet this particular learning need that we've identified in our school as being the thing that we want to move forward to? And perhaps there's a gap in what technology um, might actually fit that gap effectively because one of the key things about this fledging seed change is about teachers and um, school managers becoming better at asking questions of the people who are producing the technology so becoming better and more discerning buyers I think in the past it's been very easy for companies to um, promote so-called solutions that weren't actually designed primarily to support learners and because schools have had you know limited resources and and limited time in order to think about these things I think that the the producers have had a bit of a an easy ride now teachers and learners and schools are becoming much more discerning purchasers and that's really powerful and very important so they can say well I want something that's going to do this demonstrate to me how's your how's your technology going to help my learners understand more about what they what they know already how's it going to help my teaching force to do more formative assessment show me show me the evidence um, about how your product is going to meet my my school's needs. Do you see what I mean, Jan? Yes, I do. It's very much sort of a, a joint responsibility, isn't it, between industry and schools to make sure that we've got the most appropriate technology and tools going into the right settings for the right purposes, isn't it? Absolutely. And there are some very responsible producers. Well, I would like to um, give the... Uh, impression that I think, you know, all of the people who are trying to sell technology are, 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 are not selling optimal products. There are some great things out there. And increasingly, lots more companies, you know, particularly small companies coming into this market who really do care about learning and really want to produce things that teachers and learners can use. Yeah, we had a we had a meeting at NACE um, just uh, about 10 days ago with some of our sponsoring partners and various other educators in the room. And the, the amount of goodwill and interesting conversations that come about when you've got educators and industry in the same yeah. room is amazing. Absolutely. And that's one of the key messages that comes out of our report is this is what needs to happen more and more and more. And it needs to happen before um, companies design their products. Those conversations need to happen right at the start so that teachers and learners and researchers too who know something about the evidence around what supports learning can work with the people who make the technology and then we all end up, you know, better products, better learning. It's it's a (laughs) win-win. It is, it is. And it's lovely when you see that happening and it's very exciting and you can see that uh, there's so much potential and scope for that. Rose, um, just going back to some of the other points in the report, you, you 
you've already mentioned that it isn't so much the technology that's crucial, but the way that it's being used that is important and has the impact and moves learning forward. Now, we know that some teachers are more creative and innovative than others in doing that. So how, what are the best ways, do you think, that we can encourage more teachers to use pedagogies that are going to en enhance and transform learning using technology? I think actually you, <coughs> you've alluded to one of the important answers in your question in that it is about sharing. So I think for teachers all over the place, the most important advice you can give them is advice that comes from somebody who they feel understands the problem that they're trying to deal with. So it's a bit like, is there a teacher like me <laughs> who's got a class like me that I can learn from, who maybe, you know, isn't terribly confident with technology and understands what it's like not to be terribly confident with technology and can help me, uh, you know, learn to use things in a way that's going to, you know, suit me as a teacher and suit my learners. So it is about you know, putting people together, you know, who can help each other. And so, you know, some of the resources that are already out there, you know, we highlight in the report the Times Educational Supplement Resource where you've got teachers talking to teachers, sharing good practice, uh, you know, about lesson planning, about using different sorts of resources, not all about technology, but sometimes about technology. And then you can try and find somebody who's like you, who's got a class like you, who's trying to solve a problem like you, and find out, okay, now how do I use the technology to help me with this? So I think it is that trying to put people together who can help each other. Of course, you know, it's important that we go on providing that the, the more formal continuing professional development, and it's important that we ensure that teachers get recognition for developing these skills so it's a mixed yes. approach that's essential but that sharing is so important it is it is and i think some educators really value that opportunity to be able to contextualize a new tool a new idea a new <laughs> technology just like learners do in, in our classes yeah so true so true <laughs> Rose, there's been some suggestions that a large amount of money has been wasted in schools when it comes to technology purchases. And would you say that, well, it doesn't seem that that has been the case in the schools that provide and the settings that provide the examples in your report. But what, what's your feelings about this? I think it, it's so easy to say, look, we've spent loads of money and show me the proof, show me the evidence. And it's such a it's such a straw man, really, because you have to provide a base of technology in order for people to learn how to use it, to skill themselves up, to understand how they can then take future technologies and use them more effectively. What would be a waste would be if we didn't take advantage of the investment that's been made in the technology that does exist in, in, in schools and other institutions all over the country, all over the world, actually. So we've got this. We've invested in it. Now, how can we make the best advantage of it? That's the question that we should be asking. And no, I, I think it, it's, 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 it's just too negative to just look at We've spent that money. as it, It's a done deal. And not to realise it's about how that supports future progress and that it's that future progress that's important. And you have to get to a, a particular a point of resourcing where you can springboard into using those technologies much, much, much more effectively in an ongoing way. Um, so I, I, I think it, it, it's not the question that we should be asking. The question we should be asking is how do we make the most of this investment and, and how do we ensure that we don't actually waste the potential that we have to help teachers use technology effectively, to help learners use technology effectively and to help us become this discerning, constructive um, body of teachers and learners who demand better and better and better technology and use technology more and more effectively and change technology to meet our needs. It's that opening up of the technology that's extremely important. It seems to me, Rose, that you're saying that actually the investment in the technology is just the first stage of a journey and, and the impact might not happen immediately and we have to take a much more long-term view of the impact. Is that yes. right? 
Yeah, absolutely. It's to, yeah, it's the first step, and now we've got to make sure that we build on that first step. Yeah. yeah. So technology has certainly transformed the learning in those settings that you've talked about and in the report. And why do you think looking at the pedagogies in particular is so important, and how can we be measuring that impact? It's 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 really hard. Um, when you don't look at the pedagogy, there's a real tension here. There are, t there are two things that's very important. There's the fact that currently most of what we, will be able, what we are able to look at is how technology supports current pedagogy. And that's an important point because actually what we probably want to do in the future is think differently about pedagogy. But understandably, what we've got at the moment is a lot of evidence about how we can use technology to help current pedagogy more effectively. So we need to look at that critically and say, OK, you know, what are the good things that, that, that are going on out there? And that's why we've divided the report into those kinds of categories. So we know that learning from experts is really important and we can demonstrate how technology can help that learning process from experts or from expertise to happen more effectively. And we can also note that actually we're perhaps not taking the most advantage of the way that technologies can support dialogue between teachers and learners. I agree. <laughs> we can see some of the story is there and then we can see there's the potential for more of the story to be built. So when you start looking at things in terms of, well, what's the, the, the learning activity that we know can be effective? You start from that point and you say, okay, now how do we bring the technology in to support that learning? Then that's when we can really start to make progress. So I think it is very important to look at those effective learning practices and to see technology as just one of the resources that helps you to make that learning practice even more effective. But to some extent, it's actually rethinking pedagogies again, isn't it? It's trying to do that as well. As I say, you've got this tension here in that, in a way, you can collect evidence about what's happening because that's what's happening. Yeah. But to change what's happening, you've got to unpick it a bit more and say, OK, let's try and take it apart a bit and look at the really key activities that help people to learn. And, and then let's look at how technology is one of the resources that helps us to do that. And so I'm hoping that putting the emphasis on these uh, eight categories in the report, people can look at it and say, OK, that's something I can go with straight away. Here's a way that I can you know, help learners to explore effectively the examples that give you, you know, a, a step up in trying to get that going. But also within the report, there are questions about, well, how can we do this better? Yeah, it sounds like what you're advocating is, um, you know, starting from where we're at with pedagogies and tweaking those and refining those so that we get more, conf develop our skills and confidence and ability to be able to then transform what we're doing. That skills and confidence is the key thing. Um, just as you know, we've been running an education hack for the last two days at uh, the London Knowledge Lab. And that is a, an example where you get lots of resources together. You get teachers, you get learners, you get um, experts from academia, and you get people coming in from companies, you know, SMEs, startups, and, and some of the larger companies as well. And they all work together. And the amount of learning that can go on in that situation that takes people from one conception of what it is that they think they want to do and how they learn to quite another conception in a very short period of time when you're focusing on the learning and you're all working together is quite phenomenal. It is indeed. Yes. It sounds, sounds like you had a great two days with everybody. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Rose, so much for answering those questions. That was really helpful, and I'm sure people will be very interested to hear what you've got to say. Thank you for the opportunity. It's been lovely to talk to you, Jan.